Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have an early impression video on a very special, rare, one of a kind, you know, one of those uh, one and done fragrances that it was created once and it may never be created again. And this is from the house of Arige Ladore, one of my very favorite houses that I've come to fall in love with over the last year or so. And this is called Baikal Gris. So uh, this, I have to give a special thank you to uh, Nick who very kindly uh, sent this to me and uh, along with some other samples, we basically, uh, he, he marked them as cufflinks once and he marked them as uh, something else another time to kind of get them through and they made it both times. So uh, thank you very much, Nick. Seriously, it's very, very kind of you to send me, you know, uh, something like this where, you know, it's not made anymore. It's a one of a kind thing. Um, you know, real collector pieces, these are Riz Dores, and the ingredients are just outstanding. I have truly enjoyed wearing it as my scent of the day today, and so we're going to do an early impression video, and you guys know that basically um, these early impression videos are not first impressions because I've been wearing it all day. I've had it on my skin for about eight hours today, and I've kind of got to experience the opening a couple times because I start here, I reapply here. Um, so I've got to experience the opening and the dry down, and I'm just going to give you my thoughts on something that I probably would never have a bottle of, although if a bottle fell in my lap, I would love to own it one day, but sometimes people that, you know, get a hold of these from the very beginning, they think they're, you know, holding onto a lottery ticket or something, and they don't want to sell it unless it's at an extreme price. So if I ever found a fair price, I would absolutely get a bottle of this. But let's talk about it. So, um, first of all, I got a chance to talk to Russian Adam yesterday, and we talked about this fragrance. Uh, he gave me his kind of breakdown, and the quote that I'll take kind of from his little message that he left me is, big, calm, significant. That's the quote uh, from his little uh, message that he left me on WhatsApp about this fragrance, big, calm, and significant. And if you think about Baikal Lake, it's exactly that. It's the largest landlocked lake in the world, in Russia. And there's basically, it's not like looking at an ocean where you get these waves. It's a very calm lake when it's not iced over, of course. Sometimes it's, it's a sheet of ice because it's near Siberia. And so the story, interestingly, when he created Baikal Gris, um, the story is that it's from the fourth collection. So uh, it's from the fourth collection, which I actually have no bottles of. I would love to own, there's one from the fourth collection that I absolutely want. It's called Mas, uh, Malik Al-Taif. Uh, Malik Al-Taif is at the very top of my Ariz Ladori wish list. Um, and I've sampled it. I have a video on it. You can go check that out. It is an unbelievable rose. Maybe my favorite rose fragrance of all time. Uh, this royal grade of Taif rose. It's absolutely stunning. And the one that I want to try, there's actually two from the fourth collection. I still want to try. try. One is... Uh, ko e Noor, and the other is Oud Luwak, the coffee-based uh, scent with Oud. So there's there's still a lot more exploring of my Ariz Ladore journey to go through, but Baikal Grease checks off a big one, and this is potential full bottle worthy for me if I ever find it at a fair price. So apparently this began as a sandalwood scent. So when Russian Adam was working on Baikal Grease, uh, he originally started playing around with uh, Mysore sandalwood. And it slowly kept kind of adding things to the composition. And what he ended up adding is ambergris and what I'm going to call some sort of coniferous note, some sort of green uh, foresty like notes begin to make an appearance. And so he continued to add things like this. Violet leaf is one. Um, Russian fir balsam is another. Cypress is a third. Um, so you can kind of see the fragrance coming together in this green uh, you know, foresty type smell mixed with the ambergris. And whenever you smell it, even from the very beginning, even when the ambergris hits you right from the beginning, and it does, it hits you right at the opening, it stays throughout the life of the scent. And it's a very natural ambergris smell. And one word that comes to mind is calm. And that's part of the quote that he actually uh, left on the voicemail. Big, calm, and significant. And... Um, this fragrance is calm. It's a calming, there's something peaceful about this fragrance whenever you smell it, whenever you wear it. Uh, and in the opening, you're going to smell an ambergris that will remind you of the ambergris used in this. 
This is Atlantic Ambergris. So Atlantic Ambergris actually originally came out in the very first collection. It was part, I'm sorry, second collection. First collection was uh, Siberian Musk, Udzen, and Ottoman Empire. Second collection was uh, with the one with Atlantic Ambergris. And then it was re-released again. At, there's an Atlantic Ambergris Part 2 that came out. And that came out in um, a couple years ago. It was re-released as a Part 2, which I've smelled both. They both smell almost identical. I could almost tell no difference between Part 1 and Part 2. Uh, but Atlantic Ambergris, when you first smell it, um, if you smell Bicognis or Atlantic Ambergris, you're going to get this very distinctive... Um, ambergris-like DNA right from the get-go, right from when you spray it on your skin. I've smelled a couple ambergris fragrances that I would put in that top tier of ambergris. One is probably uh, Lesson Demo Dabla's Ombre Supreme. That's a fantastic take on ambergris. This is also Atlantic Ambergris and Bicognis, I would say, are the two from Aris La Dore. But when you smell it, you're going to get a little bit of a connection. It will remind you of each other, okay, whenever you smell. About two minutes in, though, you're going to instantly notice a shift between Bicognis, and that shift takes in the form of violet leaf. And that violet leaf kind of comes in and makes an appearance, and another note begins to kind of join the violet leaf. It joins it almost as like a wingman. Uh, it flanks the violet leaf to your nose, in, in my opinion, and that's iris or oris or oris root or iris or this sort of um, posh irisy, you know, iris in a fragrance really tends to smooth everything out to me. It It's one of the notes that seems to add this calm. And even though it's not listed as a note, I get this orisy, irisy like feeling whenever I smell by Calgadis, okay? Um, and that's, whenever I do these early impression videos, what I actually like to do is I like to kind of make notes and then go back and look at the note listing. And I was fully expecting when I looked at the note listing to see um, Iris. It's not there. It's not listed as a note. Uh, what they have listed is ambergris, balsam firs, and violet leaf in the top. Heart of ambergris, sandalwood, and vanilla. With a base of cypress, tonka bean, cypriol oil, or also known as nagarmatha oil. Which I have an entire video on that note if you want to learn more about it. Oak moss, amber, and cedar. Um, and so those green notes that you're going to get here are from the oak moss, from the cypress, from the violet leaf, and from the balsam fir, Russian balsam fir, actually. Um, and so, so Russian Adam told me that he got this image when he made this. Whenever he smelled it, he got this image of almost like this uh, sense of peace and calm. And it literally reminded him of Lake Baikal. And the, Lake Baikal is the largest landlocked lake in the world, Okay. And I believe I read somewhere that the lake is something like 30 million years old, um, which seems crazy. Seems like a long time ago. Uh, what was it? The dinosaurs were, what, 67, 64 million years ago or something? So 30 million year old lake, It's a, that is a very old lake. Uh, and it's the oldest lake in the world. And it's also the deepest lake as well. So it's the largest from surface area. And it's also the deepest. And they say it has something like 30,000 30, kilometers of surface area, and it's as deep as 1,642 meters deep. So uh, just look at some of the pictures. I mean, just Google, if you're interested, Google Lake Baikal, and just look at some of the photographs. They are heart-stopping, astounding, beautiful photographs of the mountains in the background. Um, it's just a breathtaking scene. They have their own wildlife. Uh, that kind of ecosystem that surrounds that lake. Uh, it is an unbelievable scene. The pictures are breathtakingly beautiful, completely different from the life that many of us live in. You know, if you live in the industrialized world, if you live, like for example, I live in a major metropolitan area of Texas and I could get to a grocery store in two minutes, right? Uh, I could order something on Amazon, it shows up at my house tomorrow or sometimes even tonight if I do it quick enough, right? Um, there, there are these luxuries that come with living inside of a city and connectivity and all of this stuff. But on the other side of the coin, there is this peace and serenity and breathtaking beauty of just seeing nature like that. Just seeing the open, vast expanseness of it all. Um, and thinking about, you know, the, uh, story of life as it's kind of 
come along in in just that one little you know you look at a globe and and it definitely stands out on a map because it's such a huge lake but you know you just think that's one area of the globe where where life is uh is is blossoming and and um growing and changing and all that stuff and so it's a it's a it's a very introspective fragrance to me breathtaking scenes though if you're interested in that stuff i would highly encourage you to check out some of the pictures from Baik lake baikal and so russian adam of course likes to add so the idea was to add something to uh, of his russian heritage to each of these creations and so it was an easy no-brainer for him to name it uh, Baikal Gris, right? Because uh, it fits perfectly as it gives kind of a salute to his Russian heritage, number one. And number two, it also gives you an amazing feel of the scent. At least I think it gives you an amazing feel of the scent because how does this scent wear? So the dichotomy of the scent is on one side you have this grand expanse of vastness. You know, think about... Uh, just the beauty of pristine, untouched nature, right? Wildlife native to that area on one side. Think about things like the Baikal seal that only live there, right? Um, which seems huge and majestic and grand on one side. And yet, on the other side of the coin, there is something very serene and calming and gentle about this scent. There's something almost comforting about it when I wear it. Um, and the smell starts off with ambergris. Like I said, ambergris is the star of the show, in my opinion, hands down. You cannot recreate this without using the real thing. I'm going to talk about an ambergris that I think um, maybe uses a touch of real ambergris, but it's mostly synthetic. And, um, you know, and the imagery of the scent is amazing. That's the other thing is one thing, as I've continued to test more and more fragrances, one thing that I've learned that I really love, one of my favorite features of a fragrance is when I smell it and I instantly get this like mental image in my head. It does not something I have to work at. It's not something that, you know, you have to hone your skills on. It's just natural. You just smell a fragrance and bam, it takes you to a, to either an idea or a time and place or, or like this mental image, this picture, almost like reading a book and you read about the characters, you read about the uh, geography that they're in, the time of day, you know, all the little details the author puts in there. And you get that when you smell a fragrance with this type of kind of complexity and depth. And Baikal Gris does that for me. It gives me this mental photograph, like I'm at an art museum, you know, what, looking at a photo, looking at a, at a painting. Um, beautiful imagery. And so the ambergris is probably one of the most important parts of the scent. But... Um, you know, this is a very transportative fragrance, I would say. And fragrance can teleport us, I think, in multiple ways. So number one is that fragrance can work as a time machine. And so what I mean by that is it's probably one of the best time machines we have as human beings. If you've ever smelled um, something, a scent, right? And all of a sudden you're six years old again and you're standing in your grandmother's bathroom and you remembered some sort of smell or it teleports you to a point in time when you're kind of with family and you remembered smelling this on like your uncle or you know you you remember some sort of memory driving with your father in the car and something was said and you know some memory some obscure just day that you never you know the way that the mind works is uh whenever you have extreme moments of stress those are the memories that kind of get like photo like seared into your brain right you remember the day that something crazy happened you know or there was a a lot of excitement or you had a big game or you you know graduated or you know you got married or these kind of like points in time right but the average just day-to-day -day, day sometimes it just gets kind of lost in memory right but sometimes there'll be a smell and somehow scent is like the closest association with that memory and you'll smell something and it'll like transport you to that memory long forgotten right that's one part of how fragrance can work as as a time machine the other part of it though i think is that it can take you to a place you've never been it can it can transport you to a, a not a memory you have but a memory you don't have because you've never been there and this instantly teleports me to Lake Baikal, instantly. I could see the imagery, the photographs, the, you know, um, the, uh, 
you know, you think about just the vastness of it all. This is a very vast fragrance. It's, it's very expansive. And um, Russian Adam told me that a famous Russian YouTuber said about this scent. He said, imagine that you're standing in front of a lake, Lake Baikal, and behind you is a forest. And there was a, a rain and thunderstorm. And once it's finished, the uh, wind blows from behind you and carries all of this green smell of the forest to your nose from your back. And while you're looking forward, you're staring out into the shimmering water of the lake and you get some of that watery, aquatic, you know, uh, ozonic type feel from the ambergris. Um, and I think that's actually a very fantastic description. I think it's a very fair description. So apparently this YouTuber, for this Russian YouTuber was very famous. And all of a sudden, a lot of Russian people tried to buy this scent, but it was already sold out, uh, Russian Adam had said, and he's never been able to, to remake it. So the description just says, a rich poetic tribute to Baikal. Uh, and there is a poem that goes along with this. I'll read you at the end. But I think it's a fantastic description. I think uh, this instantly goes on the list as my favorite ambergris perfumes. In fact, I think if you actually gave me a choice between Atlantic ambergris and... Uh, Baikal Gris, I think I would probably take Baikal Gris. And the reason is, is that Atlantic Ambergris has this big spicy touch of... The spices are a little heavy-handed in Atlantic Ambergris. And what I mean by that is there's lots of cardamom, there's lots of clove, and there's lots of nutmeg. In fact, I think it's one of the most nutmeg-forward fragrances I've ever smelled. <laughs> And in Baikal Gris, those spices are almost completely removed, almost like they're not even there. If they're there, it's a ghost whisper of those spices. And uh, it makes the scent seem smoother to me. Baikal Gris seems much smoother. And, um, you know, I, I think the... Similar, the similarities are, are, are great between the two. And I'll go through some of the similarities between Atlantic Ambergris and Baikal Gris. However, uh, I think what really gives Baikal Gris this smoothness outside of the spices being removed is the Mysore sandalwood. The Mysore sandalwood in this is stunning. It really does feel like it was a sandalwood-centric scent first that then got built the uh, Ambergris kind of wrapping around it so I have an eight hour dry down here and about a four hour dry down here. Oh, it's so, so good. I'm, I'm really enjoyed wearing it today. It's a couple days from the start of spring. So it's perfect time for something like this. And so let me show you kind of the similarities between the two scents because they're actually a lot. So the similarities are really astounding. Like I said, they both have ambergris, obviously. They both have tonka bean. They both have nagamatha oil. They both have violet leaf. They both have oak moss. And amazingly, what I discovered in some research is that Atlantic ambergris actually lists orris root. And orris root is um, what I thought I smelled in Baikal Gris, uh, mixed with that violet leaf in the opening. Even though it is not a listed note. And so, um, you know, Atlantic ambergris uses Russian pine for its green touch while Baikal Gris uses Russian fir balsam. But the difference to me is that lack of spices. So Baikal Gris is much smoother with that milky, sand, milky Mysore, you know, soft, spongy sandalwood is kind of what really makes Baikal Gris uh, so much smoother. It seals the deal for me, I think. I think it seals the deal for me. And I liked Atlantic Ambergris. Um, but if, I think if I had to pick one, I would I would go for Baikal Gris. Uh, now, a couple rumors about Baikal Gris I want to address. I watched a couple of videos. There were some people that said, I re, I, one reviewer I really trust, and I completely disagree with his, uh, you know, breakdown on this. But he said that Baikal Gris smells like clay. That's it. Just clay. And actually, if you look at the website, behind Baikal Gris, there's a pine cone. And there's a patch of clay with some grass growing. But you can still kind of see the clay kind of... Um, you know, coming up from the dirt, coming up from between the grass. And maybe like a piece of, you know, I don't know, maybe like a, like a blanket. It looks brown. Maybe like it looks like a suede-like blanket or, or a piece of coat or something in the background. And that's a good representation of the scent, I think. 
uh, but the clay in the background, it doesn't smell like clay. I completely disagree that I don't get this dry or wet clay vibe. Um, I do get a slightly leathery feel to the ambergris, almost like uh, somehow the ambergris that you're smelling is leathery. Not like there's a leather note, but that the ambergris itself is giving off slightly leathery touches, if that makes sense. Uh, almost like a suede-like feel to the ambergris. But in no way would I call this a suede or a leather fragrance. I don't think this is suede or leather. I wouldn't put this in the leather category, if that makes sense. This is an ambergris, sandalwood, green fragrance to me. And uh, it just smells, honestly, if you said, Ramsey, what do these two smell like? What does Bicalcadis and Atlantic Ambergris smell like? They're, they're tied together to me. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, I don't know if it's just the type of, of Ambergris used. Although, if you look on Atlantic Ambergris and Parfumo, it says white Ambergris was used. If you look in Bicalcadis, it says Indian Ambergris was used. Now, I don't know what Indian Ambergris is, to be honest with you. Um, but if you click on it, Baikal Gris is the only scent in the entire Parfumo database that shows Indian Ambergris. So that I don't know. I'll, I'll have to ask Russian Adam about that one. Um, and, and, and so, um, it just feels like, honestly, these two to me, they just feel like the story of life. That's it. That's what they feel like. It feels like the story of life in the ocean. You know, it feels like, uh, the story of, of, uh, you know, if you listen to someone like Carl Sagan, he says that there's no need for us to explore the stars because we haven't even understood the oceans yet. He said that decades ago, and he's probably still true uh, to some extent. We don't know enough about the oceans or the lakes or, you know, Baikal Gris is, uh, it, like I said, the largest lake in the world. And I'm sure that uh, there's been some serious explorations of that. But what did I say, 30,000 kilometers? I mean, uh, who knows what's what's uh, gone on in there over the 30 plus million years, right? That it's that it's been in existence. And uh, so it just feels like the story of life, like the story of evolution. It feels like a little bit like kind of the story of us in some in some ways, uh, you know, because we're part of we're part of this. Uh, we're just we're, we're part of all of this. Right. And so it feels very familiar in some ways. But it also feels very introspective, you know, whether you're thinking about like life in the forest or whether you're thinking um, about the life in the lake or whether uh, what's underneath the ice or water or whether you're thinking uh, about, you know, because obviously Siberia can get pretty cold and it can get ice over. That's the um, that's kind of the uh, duh moment of the of the century there. It can get cold in Siberia, but it can. And uh, it's, it's a very introspective perfume to me, though. It really feels, it makes me look inward. It, um, it's not something you're going to wear for compliments or anything like that. But just, I mean, imagine you're standing at the water's edge. It's night instead of day now. You're looking out at the water for answers and, or you're looking behind you to the forest for answers, or even you're kind of looking inside of yourself and you look up at the stars. And it's just kind of that you let your thoughts, it's that kind of fragrance that just lets your thoughts wander, you know, just let them go wherever they go kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, there's a couple other fragrances that have done that for me. I'll show you one that I, if you know me, you know, this is probably what came to mind when I started describing by Cogadis. It's at Ensemble Mythique by Guerlain. And Terry Bossar claims to use real ambergris in this. And it feels like there's real ambergris in this. But on the other hand, I mean, the quality of something like this, really, you can't hold a candle to, to this. I mean, Baikal Gris and Atlantic Ambergris are miles ahead quality-wise of what you're going to smell in something like the Guerlain. Um, you know, um, it's just astronomical quality for, 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 for something like Baikal Gris to me. The, the Ambergris... Um, it's very hard to describe what it does to a scent. It's almost like it works as an enhancer for the other materials, if that makes sense. Like it enhances the Mysore and enhances the vanilla and Nagarmatha and, and fossilized amber and cedar wood and cypress and oak moss and tonka and violet leaf and, and fir balsam. And it just, it, it almost like latches onto those other, uh, 
ingredients and acts as like an enhancer, if you will. Um, so, so yes, it's, um, let me read you the poem. Interestingly enough, now that I've rambled about this scent for almost 30 minutes, let me read you the poem because there is a poem that, that went with this whenever it came out. So the poem said this, warm and cozy morning dew on violets cling. I call still waters, sleeping like a king. Fur and piney sunshine, heavy fragrant air, drops of melting amber, tranquil, balsamic, fair. Cedar sliced for breakfast on a green and mossy floor. A sticky resin drizzle that leaves me wanting more. I jump into calm waters, by call woken from a dream encircled by sweet forests that are fresh and full of cream. Santal boats passing, invitation for a ride. It is slow but gracious, gliding to my side. Beautiful poem. I would love to know who wrote that, um, but it fits beautifully. And, you know, this is, um, this is special perfumery for me. This is the type of thing that uh, if you're going to spend big money on a fragrance for me, I've basically come to the conclusion at this point in my journey that there's really a couple ways that I want to go with my collection right now, with where it's currently at right now. Maybe if I didn't have the Amouages and the Rojas and the Creeds and all that stuff, I would feel differently. But the niche sector for me has just done the Stuka Dive Bomber. It is, um, it is, it's straight down. I have very little interest in what niche is putting out anymore. All I read is fancy blurbs and very little meaning behind the words, you know? Uh, it's like Remy said in one of the streams he did with Persilase where they were talking about the ingredients and he was saying all these houses show pictures of rose and ambergris and all this stuff. But then when you look in the ingredients, when you actually do GCMS uh, testing, there is no rose or if there is, it's very little. Um... And, you know, they talk about this rare oud and, and it turns out to be the tiniest, tiniest amount just so they can say it's there. And, you know, that's kind of put me off. I'm not going to lie. It, it really has. It, um, I, I think that if I'm going to spend my money at this point in time right now, that I'm going to go for vintage or I'm going to go for, you know, something like a Rige La Dore or Ensar or, you know, Rising Phoenix or... You know, some of these houses like that, Bortnikoff, or, you know, something where uh, when they say that there's ambergris in there, you're going to get ambergris, 100%. The real thing, too. Um, and, and this perfume, obviously, you know, it's not for the masses. It's not for the, it's not, you're not going to walk into Harrods and buy this. Um, but once you get to a certain point in your journey and you want to take that next step, for me, uh, this is the next step. Stuff like Baikal Gris, stuff like Arige La Dore. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure and a blessing getting to know Russian Adam. I would count him a friend, um, you know, and and he has kind of shown me so much in the perfume world with um, sending me the ingredients and getting to know the ingredients was a big part of I would say me taking the next step and trying to understand how these fragrances were made and and all that good stuff and so. Um, Special shout out to Nick for sending me this very rare, hard to come by juice. Look at the color of the juice. It's beautiful. Uh, it's got that green tint to it. Um, and so special shout out to, to, to Nick. Thanks for sharing, you know, Russian Adam yesterday, your, your story with me. I very much appreciate you telling me a little bit about the scent. It always is good when you can talk to the perfumer and mention that in the review. So yes, this is absolutely 100% positive. Will I get a bottle? It's just a matter of can you find one now at kind of a fair price. I think I would probably prioritize uh, Malik Al Taif. I think that's probably more my taste right now than Baikal Gris. Uh, however, do I like this? Absolutely. I, I absolutely enjoy it. Uh, it just smells like life to me. You know, it just smells like the story of life told in a perfume. Um, with a little bit of a Russian twist. Beautiful. Fantastic. Uh, loved it. So thanks for watching, everybody. If you've had a chance to smell Baikal Gris, do let me know what your thoughts are on it. 
And let me know what your thoughts are on the House of Arise the Doré. I love seeing your faces in the comments. Love interacting with you guys. Do like and subscribe and all the stuff I'm supposed to say as a YouTuber. And very soon we will be having some very fun blind sniff live streams. So I can't wait for those. Those will be a lot of fun. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.